from God the Father and Jesus the Christ. And I will give you a quick apology in advance because I won't be singing for you this week. Pastor Phil did that last week, but we haven't yet gotten to that lesson in our workbook, so I don't know how to implement that into a sermon. But what Phil did last week was powerful. And I think it reminded all of us about why we bother pulling ourselves out of bed in the morning to get to church on time, even when we don't particularly want to. He talked of the lives that were lived by Marie, by Daniel, by Bruce, and how those lives have impacted this church and how those legacies of love impact each one of us personally and how that alone can be the desire for us to come to church. Or maybe it's a need for us to come to church. Perhaps it's the courage that we show coming to church. And if I'm being honest with myself, and maybe if some of you are honest with yourselves, yourselves, it's not just difficult to get up on Sunday morning, but it can be difficult to get up on Monday morning. And it can be difficult to get up on Tuesday morning, and Wednesday, Thursday, so forth. Life is difficult. And for all of our advances, be they medical advances, technological, political advances, we haven't figured out how to make this life any easier. And I hate to say it from here, from this pulpit, but baptism isn't going to do that trick either. A little sprinkling of water on our foreheads isn't going to make it possible for us to just ease through life. We're still going to get sick. We're still going to fall down. We're still going to grow frustrated, angry, and we'll still doubt so much of what we do. We're still going to die. Baptism's not going to change any of that. And it doesn't matter if you get baptized as a baby or as a believer, it's just not. But we in the church faithfully do it anyway. A few years ago, we baptized my nephew. His name's Drew. He's my sister's second-born son. Um, and my sister and I have kind of grown to make cakes at all the special events that we can. So mostly they're birthdays, but we made our first one for Drew's baptism. It was a very simple cake, just a white layered cake. Um, and she wanted me to draw something religious or baptismally on top. But she didn't want to cross, so that took away the easy way out. So I had to think of what might work. Would it, would it be a shell, some water, light, a candle, a dove? What could I draw on this cake that would look like I wanted it to look and would convey that message of baptism. And while I grabbed a piece of paper and started to sketch and doodle and try to find something that worked, nothing really seemed appropriate until I had a stroke of genius, which isn't uncommon in my life, and I found a sketch that would work, that it would convey that message and would look the way I wanted it to look on that cake. And I got a lot of compliments on it. I did a very good job. <laughs> but after those compliments, I would often hear the words, and it looks really familiar. I'm not sure where it comes from, but I recognize that. And it's because what I did was I went to the bathroom, and I just drew the outline of the dove that was on my sister's bottle of shampoo. I used a logo that you have all seen hundreds of times. You've seen it in advertisements, on TV, in stores, on the internet. It's familiar to you. You know what it, mean, what it is, but it's also forgettable. It's obviously a dove. It's pleasing to the eye, and it conveys the message that dove, the brand, wants it to convey. But you couldn't immediately draw it for me. You couldn't really describe it to me, I don't think. And unfortunately, I think we experience baptism in a similar fashion. It's familiar to us. We recognize the elements of water, that it is a sacrament, in the same way communion has the bread and the wine. We enjoy seeing the babies react as the water is sprinkled on their forehead as they are anointed with the mark of Christ. We say the words of the creed. We recount the ways in which God has kept his promises through the ages. But we don't know exactly what it means for us in our personal faith walk. We're not sure how to talk about it with others. And if I may, I'd like to blame 
the writer of the Gospel of Luke for such a thing as he just wrote, and Jesus was baptized also among them. It's almost like a footnote. It's almost like a little addition to the service, which is another thing that we often walk in. We see that there will be a baptism and think, ah, the service is going to be that much longer. I'm going to be late to lunch. And that's unfortunate because baptism is such a radical notion of grace that it deserves to be celebrated. It deserves to be an important part of our spiritual lives. So a second story of my family. At Christmas, my mom and dad came down for a few days. They got here on the 23rd in the morning, and they left on the 24th to go down to Austin to visit my brother and their granddaughters and do Christmas morning there. And so in two days that they were here, they went to four services, Sunday morning, Sunday night, two Christmas Eve services. They heard me preach three times. And then on their way back to Ohio, they stopped in again on a Sunday night, and they went to Kyrie, and they heard me preach again. So in a seven-day period, they heard me preach four times, which is three more times than they'd ever heard before. And so after that last service on that last Sunday night, we went to the woodshed for dinner, and my dad finally offered his thoughts, which somewhat paraphrased, but this is pretty much what he said. You need to talk into the mic more. When you turn your head, it's difficult for me to hear you. And that was pretty much the extent of it. <laughs> He's never been one to say a whole lot. But in the way that I've learned to translate him, and I think it's a fairly universal dad speak, he said, you are my son, I love you, don't embarrass me. <laughs> but so often in those small critiques that I get countless times, the hidden message is, with you, I am well pleased and I want you to do your best. And that, my friends, is why we are baptized. Because baptism is God's message to us, that God will love us, that God will bless us, and God will keep us in God's grace, no matter what, whether we talk into the mic or if we don't. Baptism is not our becoming. It's God's moment of proclamation that we are God's creation in his own image, and with us, God is well pleased. Everything else, God will burn away. All of the chaff will be tossed aside. It's of no consequence. And that is a radical notion. In this world where everyone must be held accountable, in this world of waivers and releases, litigations and legislation, we have a God who would rather wipe the slate clean, who loves us unconditionally, in the midst of our mistakes as we continue to trespass every time that we are petulant or selfish, spiteful, mean, those acts are not accounted, they're not categorized, and they're not held on to for judgment. Instead, God forgives us, God renews us, God resurrects us. So after what this congregation has been through in the past few weeks, the loss of Bruce, of Daniel, of Marie, and of young Max at Faith Lutheran in Flower Mound, we need to know that we are loved. We need it to give us hope to go on, hope to get out of bed, and all of that starts with baptism. It starts with that spirit descending upon us with that radical grace that's present in Christ, with our dying to ourselves and being raised up with Christ and with each other. That spirit is present here now, and that spirit is present in so many moments within this church. It proceeds forth with all of you as you leave here each week, having been fed by the bread and body, having been washed with the waters of forgiveness. You are set free to live in the light of the one of whom we are unworthy to even tie his sandals. This past week here has been one of planning. It's been planning for Lent. We've been planning for Sunday school, for Kyrie. And I hate to say it, we've been planning for the next intern. I've been a witness to all of the ways in which the Spirit is moving here and the ways in which the Spirit is moving outside of these walls. We are filled with the grace of God. And we should be bursting to share that good news 
with our neighborhoods and with all of the people in Fort Worth. This gospel text, those promises that are in Isaiah, we can trust them. So I plead with you to remember your baptisms, celebrate your anniversaries, tell your baptismal stories. And when you wash your face each morning or each evening, pray. Pray for what could be despite of what is. Pray for the courage to hope for that future in which grace abounds. Peace prevails and love wins. Because every day is a good day to rise up from sleep and to proclaim those promises of the gospel. Amen.